Stallion, today we're going to record the podcast that goes through our passive income for December, but also we recap the whole year, right? Lots of lessons learned here. And I think there's a lot of benefits that you will gain from listening to this of 11 different strategies of ways that you can potentially make money passively, sometimes actively, but I think you'll get to hear a lot of this, but I want to like take you through something I heard the other day that to me connects the dots so well. Uh, uh, Joey, I know you don't watch sports of any sort other than, <laughs> other than golf. The Masters, that's about it. He, other day, there was an NFL team, that's National Football League for you, that was winning <laughs> 27 to nothing right before halftime, right? Someone out in the big wild world decided to make a bet that that team would not lose. Now, that doesn't seem to be a hard bet. And as you might imagine, there's very few people on the opposite end saying, no, I think they will lose. So that person bet a million four hundred thousand dollars. So one point four million dollars they bet in order to win a little less than a penny on the dollar to win like eleven thousand five hundred dollars. Now, okay. unfortunately, that team did lose. Oh, my Their goodness. And came back and beat them like 31 to 30. They were down 27 to nothing. And while that's an amazing comeback for that team and the fans, I'm, shoot, I'm, 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 I'm assuming they were super excited and the fans of the team who lost were completely deflated. But can you imagine the joker who bet $1.4 million to win $11,000? Like, that's just pocket change. That's nothing. But I feel like why this is such a connection, I feel like there's so many people out there betting it all on strategies that are not going to result in a in, in what they really want, right? Like that was not going to yeah. provide freedom for that person. That was probably not going to even make them excited. Like $11,000 gain would be a lot for most of us. But for someone who bet $1.4 million, it's like nothing. You don't even, you don't even feel it. And I feel like that's where people are missing the opportunity to feel what financial freedom looks like is when you can create passive income greater than your monthly expenses. Oh, I totally agree. And that's a, that's a picture of getting the wrong vision and going after something that you can't control, right? And the variables that, that led to that end result are 100% out of their hands. And that, that's the other challenge that I see that I, I want to help you as you listen to this to get out of is that you need to take control, right? Being in a passive position and putting money into hope strategies, never going to give you the result that you ultimately are looking for. And I hope that you've gained some insight along the way of Russ and I sharing our very imperfect strategies mm -hmm. and imperfect action that we're taking, but hopefully it's helped you to define what is something that you can take action on. What is something that your family could potentially have their bloodline changed by mm -hmm. implementing? And that's what gets me excited about it, Russ. I, I don't know about you, but I hope that that's what you'll take away from today's episode and each episode that we share our wins and losses I, I say we jump straight in and share these 11 strategies with everybody. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome in Tribe. This is our December 2022 Passive Income Report. And Russ, I think it's only fitting that we wrap up this year talking about how to take 11 different strategies and break them down. What's the pros? What's the cons? What do we learn from yeah. all of these different things? I, what I love about this is it does give us a chance to look back at a year's worth of education 
<laughs> right? And it, I didn't necessarily see it that way every single month. But now as I look back over a period of 12 months, I can go, man, there was 11 different ways that we were trying to build passive income yep. and, and, and very differing ways, right? I, I think sometimes we have this opinion that there's only one way to build passive income. And for most of us, at least for me, it was, oh, it has to come out of the real estate space and more specifically within the rental space, single family home space. Yep. And, and we do have that one on the board as one of the 11, but there's so many different ways that you can attempt to build passive income. And there's so many people that are doing such a better job than you and I, Stallion, on building passive income in each one of these areas. So this is, uh, I think, another thing to know is that if you really want to be successful, don't go an inch deep in 11 different directions, right? Try to find the one thing that you're going to be great at and crush it. But for us, like our podcast is an opportunity for us to, to teach and to learn um, and to kind of share from the front. So it, like, forgive us for the mistakes we're making it, the greatest one, which is going an inch deep in 11 different businesses. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So uh, you just want to start at the top and just kind of work our way down. Yeah. So, well, first, let, can you give me a summary of what happened in the year? Yes. So over the whole year, um, we netted $523,201 from all 11 of these different businesses, um, businesses or syndications or things that we're a part of. And they range all the way from, like you said, real estate related things, e-commerce related things, um, some things that are just information businesses, which we're going to go into, like maybe you're thinking, I don't know how that applies to me, but I think there's some things that you could take away from that. And then even stuff like YouTube and affiliate marketing that can add into your business plan as, as you're starting to build this. So, and, and then crypto, we also have crypto in there as well. <laughs> you just do that one in off the end and crypto and crypto. Ah, I mean, just, it hadn't been a strong year for crypto. Let's just say that. that it wasn't a strong year for you. It was a strong year for me early on. It kind of faded toward the end, but I, I was okay with it from the beginning. All right. So 11 different businesses that we produced a little over um, a million six in gross revenue and netted a little over half a million dollars. And this is the lessons that we learned in 2022 and what you can do with this information in 2023 to be successful, okay? That's the goal of this podcast. We'll see if we can execute style. Yeah. First business on the board is land flipping. Now, our buddies at the Land Geek like to call this land investing. I don't That's know right. why we said land flipping. I've always called it, it was land flipping. I'm, I'm sure that we heard them say land flipping at one point or another, and they're just not claiming it anymore. Like they've, <laughs> they've moved on from it, and they're making us out to be the slow talkers, the rednecks, who still call it something else. I, I mean, well, but it, for us, it sort of is land flipping, right? Like we're buying land and we're trying to flip it for a profit. In some situations we sold it for cash, some situations we sold it on terms. And when we look at just December's numbers alone, uh, our terms business produced a little over $17,000 net in income. And that, has been consistently growing and that has been a theme. And I love that our cash business for December was nil. Like I guess every deal we did, we sold on terms, which I'm okay that's because right. that's what creates passive income. The, the cash business is instant income. The note income is residual. That's right. Now a couple of things I'll mention. So the way that our land business is run is 100% passive. It's under a done for you model where we have partnered with thelandgeek.com and their team runs it 100% for us. However, you're thinking, I don't, maybe, I don't know if that's available to me. I'm not an accredited investor, whatever that may be. We had uh, over 100 people at the Inner Circle Live last weekend. And Tate Litchfield was speaking on behalf of the Land Geek, and the room was full of people learning that this is possible and how they can turn a side hustle, right? They have to start it as a side hustle that will eventually become scalable 
to the point where they can hire virtual assistants to run this entire business hands off and for, for less than probably five hours a week and, <laughs> and have these kind of results, right? It's not impossible to do this. Well, what I would like to tell you is if here's what it takes to be successful in the land investing or land flipping world, you have to have grit. You have to have determination to exceed. If you played any sports at any level and let's just say junior high school, high school or above, you had to have grit, right? There was just times your coaches were trying to make you stop, right? They were doing everything they could to make you quit because they were not really wanting you to quit, but they were trying to make you go through the tough. And now, not that everyone had to play sports, but what I have found is that that is a good determiner. If you have grit, if you just have determination to succeed, regardless of the pain that you will go through, that's a good characteristic. The second one is you just have to be good with people. And that can look in a lot of different forms. Like there are people that have been in sales backgrounds. They're great. Or we have people that are engineers that are notoriously not great you know, necessarily in conversation with lots of people, but in one-on-one conversations are just great, just natural at being in a conversation and comfortable talking, just talking in general. Those are the two things I've seen made make up the people that we have come across. And we've come across hundreds, Joey. I mean, we've gone to what now, 12, maybe 13 Land Geek boot camps, the quarterly boot camps that they do. That's right. And, and met hundreds and hundreds of people. But the ones that I've seen that have been successful, those are the two characteristics I keep coming back to. So when I'm talking to people and they say, I'm interested in land, I go, tell me a little bit about your background. When have you faced adversity and what happened? Okay, great. And in that conversation, I'm learning, can they talk to me? <laughs> you know, Can they just hold a conversation and be interesting, but also just be engaged. And either one of those things, I think if you have those, you can be successful in the land, investing land flipping world. No doubt. And just to kind of give you like a quick recap on the entire year, in our land business, we had um, a total of 191,000 net income from both cash and term sales. Cool. So just if you're keeping score at home, that's what we did in the entire year of 2022. Like that. that All, right, so, All right. All right. So let's go to the, the second business that we explored during 2022, and that is the short-term rental space, right? Now, there's lots of different ways you can do short-term rental. You can buy a piece of real estate and you could buy it in your local market. You could buy it in... Um, destinations, right? We have friends and, and people in our masterminds who are doing stuff at the beach, who are doing stuff in the mountains, who are doing stuff at the lakes. Ours is not nearly as exotic as that. Ours is, we are <laughs> renting apartments and condos and townhouses in Birmingham, Alabama, our local market, and renting it out to people who are traveling for one reason or another, not a destination. So completely right. different. And so we don't own the real estate there. We're doing what's called rental arbitrage. And the year was a great year. Just the last couple of months kind of ended poorly, Joey. So I think we ended right. this past month in December, actually, with the loss for the month, right? Yeah. If you, if, if we'll, I'll break it down into two pieces because I think this is important. We have a management company aspect and we have our actual investments in these units. So the investments in the units in the month of December, lost a total of $8,011. That's never good, right? Uh, but there was, a, there was a massive amount of cancellations due to COVID in December. I know that there was several that uh, our operator was sharing with us about that. And it just is naturally a slow time for people to be traveling. In addition, our, our management company has fixed expenses that don't go away and so whenever there's not a lot of rentals in the actual investment side of the units, those feed to the management. And so we had a loss of 44, 48 in terms of the actual management company itself. All right, flip over to the year. I wanna talk a little bit for the year, what happened in the short-term rental space, because it's, as you see this over the year time frame, which I think we have to evaluate over a period of time and not just in, in the short run, we right. we did a little over a hundred thousand dollars 
in income in our short-term rental space, and then another 10,000 on our management company. This, right. here, here's an interesting part, because there's many of you that are looking to get in the short-term rental space. Maybe you are already in the short-term rental space and, and you're like, okay, how do I get this going? Well, we built a course. Well, I say we, just like anything, Julie and I do very little other than run our mouse. Our <laughs> operator built a course taking all the all the information that he's learned over the last two and a half, three years of running this business and put it into a specific course. You, if you're interested in that, you can go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash STR course and get access to that. We, through this process, though, realize that we don't have to be investing all of our money in doing this. There's other people out there that want to learn how to do this. And we can just help them by managing the units that they have. That's where our management company came from. And because Joey and I are not a participant in that, it allows it to be passive for us. So over the year, even with paying the operator all the fixed expenses and all the things, we still were able to net a decent little profit. I mean, you, you divide that out, Stallion, over the year, it's a little over $800 a month. That's pretty good, right? Most people would take an extra $800 in, in a space that they didn't have to really do anything for. That's right. And it's allowing us to have on the other side the extra hundred and three, almost hundred and four thousand from our actual units being run. So it's just a cherry on top, in my opinion. And it gives us the ability, like looking forward to 2023, what is something that we can do to enhance this report? And I think one of those is just co-hosting, right? Using our management company as a means to expand without any additional investment on our part. So I identifying investors who want to get into SDR short-term rentals in our area, but don't have the time to actually manage their units. This is something that is an asset to our, that, that we can now provide to the marketplace and start to scale that up uh, in a very quick manner um, without any additional investment. Well, and so what is it, how does this help you, right? This is how this helps you get started creating passive income in any area for yourself. That's right. And by learning how to do it yourself and being able to approve a process over time, there will be others who will want to do the same, but won't want to do the work and will want to figure out how do I plug in to what you're accomplishing? So you could become a co-host. So you, after you do this a couple of times, you get the systems in place. Now you've built the value that people would be willing to pay for. And I think that's a humongous opportunity. And here's the thing that I learned from our business, Joey, in 2022 is, and we've said this a couple of times, but I'll repeat it because I realized that everybody who's listening today was listening before, is that we are very heavy in a business travel, um, it, team travel type world because we're that's renting right. out one and two bedroom apartments. As, a, as the majority of our stuff, that misses the replacement market. That misses the opportunity of people when their houses have been flooded out. I know you just had a property that got flooded. Like that misses the opportunity for those people who have who are displaced or who are moving into the area and need a temporary house. They don't necessarily want to move their family into an apartment unless that's where they've always lived. So for everybody who maybe is looking for those places, they're looking for a single family home. And so for us, we need to adjust and we're going to make some adjustments. Most of our leases are going to start coming up in uh, July of 2023. We're going to make some adjustments. We're going to get rid of a lot of these apartments and start actually acquiring more single family homes. So if you're in the Birmingham area and you're looking to uh, maybe get rid of some um, single family homes that you have and they're three bedroom, four bedroom, reach out to us. We'd love uh, to do that. And we're going to be seeking people to do that because now I feel like the market is much more in the buyer's uh, arena to be able to find properties that are not necessarily super inflated that could fit our criteria. Yep. So move, moving on to the third strategy that we used, um, the, or excuse me, the fourth strategy, because the management company was the third Fourth strategy would be in the crypto space. So we both did Ethereum mining through computers that we owned and were operated by a third party. And we also invested in a Bitcoin mining fund. Now, what are some thoughts that you have around that particular piece for 2022? 
the price of crypto nosedived. <laughs> that's, yes. that is, that's my thoughts. And <laughs> I'm optimistic, especially after our recent interview with Bob Burnett, Bitcoin Bob, as I have to refer to him, is that we feel like the utility of those um, technologies will continue to grow in demand. And as a result, the price associated with their tokens should increase. We're seeing some small increases here at the beginning of January. I hope that that continues. It's one of those things where, as we've been, we mined Ethereum for almost five years and, and that kind of ran its course. So a lot of our income and stuff that we reported was the, the tokens that we mined from Ethereum. Those miners don't exist anymore. As you said, we, we moved to Bitcoin mining. And so we have a, a good chunk of money in that. It just hasn't started producing yet. One, because it just came online at the end of the year. And secondly, because the cost are equaling the revenue we're bringing in because the price of the uh, token is is not that much. But I, I see, Joey, in 2023, I see as a, seeing an increase in price in that. And with that, I see some decent revenue. I To me, that's the cherry on top. That's one of those ideas where people are out there saying, hey, I'm choosing what passive income path or uh, avenue will I go down? I would say put that one at the end of your list. Don't put that at the beginning of your list. I know it's super interesting. It's super fun to talk about, but yet it's not the most steady, consistent. When we're building passive income, why are we building it? It goes back to financial freedom equals passive income greater than our monthly expenses. That's right. For us to get out of trading time for money, we have to have a consistent income. And that would be one I would not want to bank on. So I would say, while it's fun, it's interesting, I'm glad we're doing it to teach about it and talk a little bit about what's going on in that world. I want to make sure that that's the 11th thing that you would do, not the, not the first, not the fourth. It's, these aren't labeled in number of choices. This is just how we have it listed on our report. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the passive income operating system, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income. It makes all the steps come together. If you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener, we've never given this away in public before. Go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash P-I-O-S. There was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying, pop quiz day. Why? Because you were unprepared. Are you unprepared, though, for financial freedom? Don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30-second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. Well, and, and also remember that we are attempting this after having built all these other income streams. And this is really more of a play in our minds of a, a storage of value, right? We're seeing that the U.S. dollar is diving um, that with inflation uh, pressures and so on. And so having money in an alternative currency is a more of a defense strategy. It's really not an ultimately income play for us, although it could be. And so that's why we report it, but we also want you to know the, the strategy behind it for us is different. I think something that would be really interesting in 2023 for us, Russ, is to spend some more time with the crypto experts in the world to figure out ways in which they are active, like actively creating passive income through crypto, other crypto strategies that we don't even know about. So I'd love for if you if you're listening to this and you have uh, people that you follow or that you are currently doing a strategy uh, that is creating passive income through crypto, I'd love to learn more about it. I can't guarantee that we're going to do it, but I definitely would love to learn and uh, be able to share those things with others. And as I love to bust Joey's balls, if you're not listening to this, you wouldn't have heard what he said. Okay. <laughs> so the uh, moving, on to, moving on to the next one. That is, by the way, that's just something that's in me. I don't know why, Joey. I, I apologize. My dad used to do that, though. My dad was a contractor. We'd go over to people's houses and they'd say, my hot water heater's out. And he'd go, really? 
that's interesting. Well, um, it doesn't sound like you need one. If you already have hot water, why would you need to heat it? <laughs> He'd be like, so your water heater's out, right? And they would kind of be like, okay, GA. <laughs> so that's just me with you. I'm sorry. This, my thank thank you for that, Russ. Taught me to be a jerk. So the, the fifth number on the board here goes into syndications. And, you know, we, we've been really careful over the life of our podcast, not to just have syndicators after syndicators on our podcast, right? There's so many different syndications that exist out there. This is where people go and they find an investment opportunity. They, they set it up in a way where they can pull money from a group of people to invest in it. Another term for that is syndication. And we have personally invested in a couple of syndications. And two of those that we've listed uh, throughout this year were was a private note fund that we were part of, as well as a syndication within the ATM. So we, we own actual individual ATMs, but they are part of a larger pool. And so we get the benefits of the larger pool, but also we get the individual benefits of the actual depreciation of the actual equipment itself. And throughout the year, these are the ones that I would say for the person who's looking for consistent income, steady income, you're going to typically see syndications meet that, assuming the operators behind them uh, have a track record, know what they're doing. They're in a space that, um, has demand and you know, other other things that would not lead itself to the vol, uh, volatility. But for us, eight, the ATMs and the private note fund for the year, Joey, provided a lot of uh, consistency. If you click over there, I would know what that total is. Yeah, it so was, you're talking b- between the ATMs and the private note fund, they provided $27,543.91 throughout the entire year. Um, yeah, the, the only thing we didn't do is we just didn't put a lot of money in there. It's just because for us, it was not that interesting. It didn't meet our investor DNA. But had we put as much money into those things that we put into some of those others, those numbers would be significantly larger, true? That's right. And and that's something to also consider in your investor DNA and your resources and your time allotment that you have. I mean, so, several of the people that I met at our inner circle live in person, just some sidebar conversations that we had. This is their main strategy because they're working. Uh, one guy in particular we talked to, he travels 140 days a year. And he's like, man, I'd love to do, do more of these things that are side hustles, but I just don't have the bandwidth to do that. So it, for me, it's how can I get involved in some of these things as, an, as a passive investor that would potentially get me to financial freedom faster. Cause he doesn't want to keep doing that. Right. He doesn't want to keep traveling like he has to, but until he can get to that financial freedom number, he's just looking for uh, alternatives and, and syndication so far have been the answer. So the, the next one on our list was house flipping. Go back to that page there, Joey. Oh, okay. Cause it, we don't have it in the month of December, but we, we flipped the house, man. We're house flippers, right? Like, I mean, I'm still waiting on the HGTV, you know, network to connect with us on, <laughs> Hey, can you guys show us how to buy a property, do absolutely nothing to it and then sell it months later and make a profit because everybody would like to do that. That's right. That's what we did. That is that is something to be proud of, Russ. And but I I will say this. I and I'm just gonna go ahead and throw this out there. I sent you a text recently, and there's a Zillow update on the particular property that we sold. And what has it been doing lately? The, the value the is has been going down. dropping. And I the only thing I can say is this is a, a real testament to the Lord's timing because we sold it at the tip top of what it was probably worth um, without having done a whole lot of renovations or any renovations for that matter. Um, And we were able to make $13,000 on that. Now, I think there's some actually some more profit that we didn't account for. Like we got some money back for things that uh, insurance uh, premiums and things that weren't counted in this. But just hard and fast, $13,000, I I don't think this is a strategy that I'm really excited about continuing, Russ. 
because um, well, the 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 perceived challenges around it were far greater than the reward, in my opinion. Well, well here's what I'm going to say is that for 99.999% of the population, land, house flipping is not a passive strategy. It's super active. Uh, yes. we, we, we know people who do hundreds of home flips a year. They, they do, they do quite well. Their business is, is, has done well. Obviously the last couple of months have been a little, you know, shakier than they would have liked, but it's still a, a really good active business. And if that's what you're seeking as an active business, knock yourself out. For us, I, we could, we could put this as a passive business because we literally did nothing personally. Yeah. And I mean, there was nothing to be involved, but for most people, it is active. So I think you have to be cautious not to consider flipping houses as an active strategy, because if you are, then great, but then evaluate, okay, well, how much money can I make doing that actively? How much of my time does it take? And is it what I'd love to do? And if so, great. And compare it to what else you could be doing actively. Can you make the same amount of money or greater in, in a, the same amount or less time? I always like to evaluate when I'm making one decision, what's the alternative? Because there's always an alternative. Mm -hmm. What is the alternative doing one versus another? And okay, now I have two active strategies. Which one will produce the greatest result for me? And which one will I have the greatest enjoyment of? And also I would say too, is that most active businesses that you're involved in, sometimes people are, um, you know, they're, they're 1099 contractors, for instance. They will never, ever in their life have to write a check to go to work. But in that business, you can write checks. <laughs> you can write big checks. So I just always like to call this out For because sure. sometimes people get really interested in land flipping or, or not land flipping, but uh, house flipping and don't realize that some people write major checks to be in that world. That's right. And if you don't do it well, it can it can be a negative to you. So, all right, Russ, I know we're getting close on time, so I'm going to kind of go through some of these fairly quickly. Another strategy we employ is long-term rentals. And right now we, we have just the one, uh, my condo that we actually rent to our short-term rental business. It's consistently created $200 a month in passive income for me. And that's great until December hits. And your condo is in a three stack uh, in the building and the top unit has a pipe burst mm. and that water must flow down. And so the $2,400 that you see that I netted for the year is about to go towards an insurance deductible to repair the unit that cannot be rented by the way, until that repair is completed. So it's affecting multiple things. And I will say this, this is the, one of the reasons why long-term rentals is not my favorite strategy because the, the profit is not um, huge when it compares to what it will actually, you know, what expenses come along the way. One major expense like this can wipe out a year or more worth of profit. And um, that's just difficult for me to swallow. So well, well, here's, here's the, here's the lesson here is Depending on your profile, single family homes probably may or may not be a fit. I guess that's an obvious. Sorry, that was stupid. Let me say something more insightful. <laughs> if you have one unit, you have a hundred percent chance that it could be flooded, a hundred percent chance it can be occupied or not occupied, giving you really uh, lots of volatility. Joey, if you had a hundred of these single family homes, it would be different, right? Throughout the year, you're going to have four or five that are going to get flooded out, and those are going to lose money. And you're going to have a, a group are going to have some random maintenance. They're going to need issues. Those are not going to make money. But what you would have is a portfolio of homes earning a very steady income where someone else is paying down the debt on them. And because our government's putting money, they, they are appreciating in value. And down the road, you can start taking cash out in the form of refinance that is not taxable. Like that is a really exciting strategy, by the way. If you had a hundred homes and you were taking out a hundred thousand dollars a year out of each one of those homes, that would be good. I don't think you would complain about that. The That's difference right. is, is you only have one. So for most people, buying one single family home is the worst thing they can do. 
and I've said that multiple times, I'm going to repeat it, buying one single family home could be the worst thing you do on your journey to trying to become financially free. If you decide that this is what you're going to do, single family homes, go buy 10, right? That's right. Buy 20. Have a pathway to, to 100. If that's not your route, think multifamily, right? If you have the ability to do it on one or 10 homes, why could you not own 100 doors in, a, in a, an apartment complex? Giving you, again, economies of scale, which allows you the ability to offset some of the individual happenings that just come, come with the with life. That's right. Speaking of losses, let's get to <laughs> another strategy that we, that, that I, and I'm going to say we, I didn't do it, but you did it, but I'm a part of this with you, is that another strategy was renting an RV. That's so talk right. a little bit about your year with Cousin Eddie and its uh, failures. Yeah. Um, well, I'll go ahead and say this. Don't buy an RV with the thought process, this is going to be a cash cow just racking up income for you. Buy an RV if you want an RV <laughs> and rent it to offset some of the expense, if you if you will. In the court, in the year, or first of all, so November, the um, existing management company I had went out of business, hundred percent out of business, and that tells you that overall this year has been difficult to uh, attract the RV renter that was very present in 2020 and 2021. Um, it, I just think that the actual travel practice, if you will, of people changed and they have way too much. Uh, what, what are you shaking your head about? I, I don't believe that, man. Here's the lesson here. And I, I, I wish we had the ability for our podcast editor to go and do a call back to the episode three months ago when I called you out on this thing. Okay. And I said, I think your issue is your operator. I think your group is not able to market your unit. And the fact that they went out of business. Okay. There's, there's a couple of potentials for that. One is nobody rents RVs, right? That's possible. It's just not logical in my brain that everybody is losing money in the RV world today. I don't think that that's true, but I do think that the demand has dropped significantly. I, I don't think it has been. I just think it's, well, here's a couple of things. One, I think operators important, vital in all, it, when you're investing money in any business, the operator is crucial. That's the reason why if you're going to be the one doing it as a side hustle, you need to become an expert. Mm -hmm. If you're going to invest in one, you need to be investing in experts. Joey, would you have classified them as an expert? No. Scale of one to 10, would they be an expert? No. no. Where, where would you have put them on a scale of one to 10 as far as expertise? Probably a six. Okay. So we don't invest in sixes, but you did. Hey, you did it because you, again, you wanted an RV. Here, here's the thing is what I, my opinion, 100% have one useless to most people other than me, because I like to talk about it, is that when you rent something, it has to be unique. If you're going to rent a short-term rental, it needs to be unique. If you're going to rent a car, it needs to be unique. If you're going to have an RV, it needs to be unique. So other than the name, which is amazingly unique, there was nothing really, it, it fit a couple more people than another one, but not so much different. So like we, we have a friend who bought a bus, right? How many buses are out there for rent? A lot or a little? Less, yeah, a little. Right? Like, or one of those pull behinds, right? That that can go and be taken to a spot, right? There's a unique thing. I will drive it, I will drop it off, I'll come back and pick it up. Like that's a unique feature. So I think you didn't you lack the unique feature, you lacked an excellent operator. If the operator had been excellent at marketing, you may not have needed the uniqueness to overcome it. That's fair. So that's my opinion. I don't know. I, the good news is I have a new operator and yeah. this operator has been around a lot longer and seems to have better, better skills and better systems and so on. Um, but over the course of the year, just so you know, lost $2,200 on cousin Eddie. And, and you owned it. If you, if you took, you, you rented it out to a friend for a weekend, which is amazing. I love that. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's right. I, I did this all for you, Russ. That's what this is about. And if um, I would have had to pay retail, it would have probably broke even because of that. So <laughs> I know I'm busting you up, man, but I just, this is more for everybody else, right? That's right. All right. So let's, let's quickly get through these last three uh, strategies. First of all, our community, our information business netted in the month of December, $20,762 and 86 cents. On the course of the year, the information business made $148,562. Now, that's good for us. How does that affect you listening right now? Like, how do you make this application to something that you can do with what we've learned from this? What would you say for us? Well, you're following one of these pathways. You're land flipping. You're doing short-term rental. You figure out how to to do the RV and actually make money where where we didn't like you you find you, you get excellent in the e-commerce space you find a way to create value and you make money in it others are want to want to know and you can go and create courses around what you learned and people will pay you for it now you have to be good at marketing and there's ways to do that you can create podcasts and of course if, if the two of us can have a million downloads anybody can there's ways to take your knowledge and create streams of income that doesn't mean you have to go buy something. And I think this is encouraging for a lot of people is that, man, there's ways to build courses. There's ways to build groups that can bring people together, right? Like one of our groups is the inner circle. We have an inner circle plus we have a passive income mastermind. We all have all these different groups. Now we didn't label all of those in here, but we have groups and courses and content that we've been able to figure out some things. And then it's like, if it worked and we can prove it works, then why not be willing to share that with the world? And if it's worth something, have them pay for it. And if they pay for it, then there shows the proof of value. Well, and I'll say, I'll say this, you will know when it's time to create a course. The thing that I think people fail in when it comes to this area of the business and the space is they think just because I found it interesting, I need to create it for everybody else. When people want to know what you've done, you will know that it's time for a course. They used to get multiple people asking the same questions over and over and over. Even just for you know simplicity, you may want to create a course just to keep from answering the same questions over and over. So I think, you know, there's the good news is that it's not difficult, right? Creating a course is super easy. What, what would you say, like some tips for somebody well, that may be in that space? Well, here's the win to creating a course. I think this applies to so much of what you probably are doing. You're trying to build something in your business. If you could teach it to someone then one, you can remove yourself out of it. The E-Myth Revisited, great book that goes into detail of how we need to be able to write down exactly what we do in our process so someone else can do it so that you can then move out of the S quadrant into the B quadrant. Well, for us, everything that we've been able to create in a course was an idea, was a concept. It was something that we were doing. So when we had to write it down, one, we realized there was lots of holes in our what we were doing. We're like, That's oh right. man, like we were forgetting all of these things. So we needed to put that in there. So the teacher always learns more than the student. So what it did for us, it improved everything that we were doing because it forced us to fill in the gaps for the things that we actually had misses on. Because when someone comes back and they go, yeah, but I don't know how to do this thing. You kind of miss that. I'm like, huh, no wonder we have an issue in that area, right? Like, because we don't necessarily have a standard way of handling it. So every time we've been able to build a course stallion, it's made us make our process so much cleaner, so much simpler. And I think there lies an opportunity for everyone or most people listening to this right now for you to be able to say, what do I do and how do I teach someone else how to do it? And if I can teach them, I can build a course. And if the course has value, like we interviewed Pat Flynn on our podcast and the way that he got into now millions and millions of dollars of revenue from courses and affiliate um, commissions came from him building a course for people to learn how to pass a specific part of the architectural test. I think yeah. that there's crazy amounts of knowledge and opportunities for you to get into the information space. No doubt. No doubt. 
All right. So rounding out, I think the biggest opportunity in my mind for 2023, as we're looking at, is e-commerce. In the in the year, so first of all, in the month of December, we had no income either through stackcandles.com and 100 unicorns I actually had to put money into without <laughs> gaining any sort of real revenue. So lost $685 there. Year to date in both of those businesses, um, we lost $1,265. Now that's because of 100 unicorns. Okay, it's still on hold. It's still getting there. But I think the biggest opportunity for us is to see uh, a real investment in e-commerce space with proper operators who are already making money instead of these startup kind of deals. That to me is the thing that is the, the missing component for us. And, and I think it's something that people are starting to see the market is this is where it's at, right? This is where people are going and we got to be in the way of creating that passive income through e-commerce. What do you say to that? Well, no, I, many of you have probably read the book, Buy Not Build. And I feel like that that's what you just described. You've been trying to build something from scratch. And it's fun to build something from scratch when you it, we don't have tons of money in it and you have other income streams. It's not your main line. I think too oftentimes we want to invent instead of innovate. And the key difference between those two is utilizing the innovation is finding something that's already working and working well, and then tweaking a little bit with it, like adding extra value to it that doesn't exist, right? Like maybe you're an amazing operator of businesses and you can go in and buy a company that's, that's doing really well in spite of the operators that are in them. Right. Yep. right? Yeah. And, and, and you can then, add some innovation operationally management to the business that could let it go to a new level. I think there's the opportunity within the e-commerce space is to buy, not build just to your point. Last space is, it, Hey, you know, if you really want to be a fancy influencer like Joey and I, <laughs> and, and you really want to live, you know, really well, I know many of you are watching YouTube and you're following, you know, the, the latest TikTok, you know, the hottest best friend, or you're, you're watching Mr. Beast on YouTube and you're like, man, how do I make so much money like them? Or like Joey and Russ, I mean, there's ways, right? You can take your YouTube videos and you can like monetize them. And I mean, just like us, I mean, you can make just hundreds of dollars. 414 <laughs> to be exact on the year, the entire year. So, let, lesson behind that is that we um, we're, we're not going to become rich off our YouTube videos. No, and 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 that's probably. But it is you know we had to monetize it to be able to figure out what you make on it so we could share it with you. And we have hundreds of thousands of views, you know, on on uh, YouTube, but it still doesn't translate to lots of money. I'm you know I'm assuming you have to get into the tens of millions for you to start making money there. That's right. So just to wrap up, the month of December, we netted out a little, almost almost 27,000, which is lower than any month in the year. However, we finished the year to date total at $523,201. And the big, the big lesson here is you can do the same thing, right? This is not, we are not experts in any of these spaces. We're just learning as we go and trying to share with you uh, two beggars trying to tell you where the bread is found. And hopefully that's what you're picking up, the breadcrumbs each every month. And I just want to ask you to continue to share this. If you're getting value from it, uh, number one, take action. Number two, share it with a friend, somebody that can like and review uh, this podcast so that we continue to get the word out. At the end of the day, we want freedom for you and your family and, um, yeah, thank you for being on the journey with us and we will catch you on the next episode. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.